When animals kill humans, authorities may take swift action to eliminate the threat. Once an animal has tasted human flesh, they almost always attack again. But sometimes, the animal evades authorities trying to hunt him down and lives to kill another day. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we tell the story of three killer bears that are still on the loose. Welcome to Final Affliction. Yellowstone National Park is not only home to a wide array of wildlife, but also bubbling hot springs, towering mountains, and crystal clear lakes. It boasts of over 500 geysers with the famous Old Faithful Geyser shooting a plume of steam and hot water high up to the sky. The park also boasts of over 200 hiking trails that usually burst with color as wildflowers bloom in the spring, creating a stunning display of natural beauty. It is a place of unparalleled beauty that every hiker dreams of setting foot in. And thus, it was no surprise that on the 28th of July, 1984, Swiss national Brigitte Friedenhagen, together with her brother and sister-in-law, headed to the park, expecting a fun-filled family outing. The trio was excited to be there. They spent the first two days camping and watching the geysers at the Norris Geyser Basin. However, Brigitte wanted to quench her thirst for seeing the famous Yellowstone Bears. And so on the second day, Ranger James Youngblood handed Brigitte her camping permit for Site 5B1 on the Broad Creek Trail in Pelican Valley. The ranger reminded her of how wild the bears of Yellowstone Park were and warned her against traveling alone on the trails or keeping food in her tent. That evening, the trio talked about their plans for the next day. They would hike six miles to the Astringent Creek Bridge, from where Brigitte would proceed alone to Campsite 5B1. After camping alone for one night, she would then hike to the Grand Canyon, where she would meet her brother and sister-in-law. The morning came, and the trio, sticking to their plan, made their way to Astringent Creek Bridge. Along the way, they saw a large placard warning of the untamed wilderness within the Yellowstone backcountry. At the junction of Astringent Creek and Broad Creek, Brigitte's brother and her sister-in-law gave her a quick hug and watched as she disappeared into the winding hiking trail. After months of saving every penny for the trip, here was Brigitte hiking alone. It was happening. She couldn't help but feel a sense of freedom and joy wash over her. She stood, taking in deep breaths of the crisp countryside air as the gusting wind whipped through her hair. The experience was exhilarating. She felt alive and free. Her responsibilities left in Switzerland. Yellowstone was now hers to conquer. Aware of high bear activity, she knew the key to avoiding a bear encounter was by creating lots of noise. She tied two bear bells on her backpack, which would create a tingling noise to scare away any bears on her trail route to camping site 5B1. The Pelican Valley offers a relatively lush plant growth of sages, forbs, and grass. It is the ultimate bear's paradise, and Brigitte was there to witness the bears in their untamed nature. Nothing could stop her now. She pressed on with a smile on her face and a spring in her step. A few hours into her hike, Brigitte was attracted to the sound of running water. She had arrived at White Lake. Here, she found Campsite 5W1, which was empty. She was only three and a half miles away from her designated campsite, 5B1, at Broad Creek, but her feet were burning from fatigue. The thought of venturing further alone in her exhausted state was unpleasant to her, so she made camp at White Lake Campsite 5W1. She made dinner as she watched the sun sink below the horizon. After dinner, she found two pine trees 85 feet from her campsite. She climbed up and strung a rope between the two and hung her food. She then changed into blue pajama pants, took out her journal and scribbled, I have taken all the precautions. Brigida then got into her sleeping bag with her head near the door of the tent. She placed a flashlight on one of her sides and a cassette player on the other. The dark clouds gathering above Yellowstone finally gave in. The gentle pitter-patter of the rain on her green dome tent pulled her into a peaceful state. She curled up tighter in her sleeping bag for warmth. As the rain poured, she drifted further and further away, her dreams 
voyaging her on journeys far beyond the bounds of Yellowstone Park. Outside, the winds howled as lightning illuminated the darkness, casting brief shadows of the tree trunks. But she remained undisturbed, lost in the sweet embrace of her sleep. Brigitte didn't notice as a shadow emerged from the woods. A grizzly bear cautiously approached the tent, tasting the air as it lumbered closer. The smell of a possible meal drew it closer to the tent, where the 24-year-old Brigitte was peacefully resting. It stood on its hind legs with its claws drawn and ready. With a single swipe, it tore down the tent from top to bottom on the right side of the door. The grizzly then stuck its head into the tent and with a single bite grabbed Brigitte by her head, sticking its fangs into her face and skull. It pulled her out of the tent, crushing her jawbone in the process. She screamed in pain, trying to free herself as the bear dragged her away into the cold, dark night. At 3.30 p.m. the next day, Brigitte's brother and sister-in-law were waiting at their meeting point on the trail. They had known her to be time-conscious, and so as the minutes passed by, they grew nervous. Soon, minutes turned to hours, and their feelings grew to fear. Something is not right, they thought to themselves. They hurriedly rushed to the Fishing Bridge Visitor Center, where they informed the ranger on duty that Brigitte had not shown up. The ranger immediately issued a missing hiker alert in the park. At 8.15 p.m., the alert of a missing hiker finally got to the ranger manning Pelican Valley, who instantly embarked on a search mission. The ranger patrolled the valley, and by 11.30 p.m., his efforts were fruitless. Throughout the night, the rangers kept an eye on the hiking trails with hopes that Brigida would finally show up. The clocks were striking 7 in the morning more than 12 hours after Brigida was reported missing, when Ranger Marshall was dispatched on a horseback to trace her. Marshall followed Brigida's hiking route, and at White Lake, he saw a green tent with a red sleeping bag outside the tent. To him, this was odd since Campsite 5W1 hadn't been booked recently. He immediately got off the back of his horse to investigate the site. He noticed a large tear on the right side of the tent's door. On peeking inside, he found her hiking gear intact. 85 feet from the tent was a bag hanging from two pine trees, just as Brigida had done two nights ago. The bag was ripped apart with its contents scattered on the ground. Not far from the campsite, Ranger Marshall found a human lip, muscle tissue, and hair with a scalp attached to it. He immediately radioed the other rangers of his findings and continued his search for Brigida. Rangers Tim Blank and David Sprites arrived at Campsite 5W1 in a helicopter armed with loaded shotguns to aid in the search. The three followed a trail of Brigida's body parts to the north of the campsite. At about 10 meters from the campsite, the trail of carnage led to a small patch of grass that had pieces of tattered blue clothing and lots of human tissue. It was here that the bear had stopped dragging Brigida by her head and began feeding on her. Due to the heavy downpour, the rangers had a rough time tracing the bear's steps, but after hours of tracking, they finally found Brigitte's body 250 feet from her tent. The skin on her arms had been completely peeled off up to the shoulders, and her left foot was detached from her ankle. Her muscle flesh on arms, legs, buttocks, and upper torso had been completely mauled. That evening, Brigitte Friedenhagen's remains were flown to her devastated brother and sister-in-law at the Fishing Bridge Valley. On August 3, 1984, the couple flew back to Switzerland with Brigitte's ashes. What was supposed to be a fun family vacation had turned out to be the most grotesque bear attack in the history of Yellowstone National Park. To this day, the ferocious killer bear that ended the 24-year-old's life has never been caught and is still lurking around campsites in Yellowstone, waiting to bring more unsuspecting campers to their gruesome final affliction. The Wyperis Creek Trail System is a network of biking and hiking paths that wind through the boreal forest. It is surrounded by towering trees and offers breathtaking vistas of the infamous Canadian Rocky Mountains. As you make your way along the trails, you'll see a diverse array of wildlife including bison, elk, exotic birds, deer, and black and grizzly bears. If lucky enough, 
one can spot trout fish jumping to catch low-flying insects on the Ghost River, which joins the Bow River at the Ghost Lake. The trails also offer a strenuous, challenging workout through the rocky terrain and steep inclines. However, no matter how difficult the hiking or biking is, the views are always worth it. It is a must-visit destination for anyone seeking adventure and a connection with Mother Nature. Dr. David Lertzman was a 59-year-old senior instructor at the University of Calgary. He was an assistant professor of sustainable development and environmental management at the university's Haskane School of Business. He had a passion for the environment and organized week-long wilderness retreat courses in Kananaskis, where students would be taught how to use their senses in navigation and also meditation to find their places in the environment. He and his wife, Sarah Lertzman, lived near Wiperus Creek, northwest of Calgary. Their home's location provided unlimited access to the hiking trail system near Ghost River, where David would trail run twice a day as he sought his deep connection with nature. On Tuesday, 4th of May, 2021, the clocks were ticking at 6 p.m. when Dr. David left home for his second run of the day. He chose the Moss Trail as his preferred path as it wound its way through towering cliffs, ascending higher and higher into the hill. He relished the challenge ahead, and his feet pounded the ground as he stepped into the trail. He let his eyes adjust to the dimming light because the day was drawing to a close. He took a moment and soaked in the beauty of his surroundings. He felt the wind carrying the sounds of the night whip past him and instantly invigorate his senses. From the nearby chirping of crickets to the distant bellows of bison, the woods were about to come to life. He saw a high embankment along the trail where he paused to catch his breath. He stood close to its edge and decided to enjoy the breathtaking views from the top of the embankment. He stood still as he let his eyes wander until they fell on something interesting. Far below, he could see the twinkling lights of the town, a reminder of the never-sleeping world he had left behind. Up there, he felt a million miles away, as though on top of the world, surrounded by the stillness and beauty of nature. He had never felt so alive and so connected to the wilderness around him as he did at that very moment. He was lost in thought, soaking up the peace and quiet of the wild. However, unbeknown to him, a female grizzly bear and her cub were feeding nearby and had heard him approach the embankment. Without warning, the sow grizzly appeared from the underbrush and silently sneaked up behind him. With his eyes gazing at the distant sea of lights, Dr. David was so absorbed in the view that he didn't notice that a grizzly was fast approaching until it was too late. Back at home, Sarah was beginning to fill with a sense of urgency and fear. It was almost 10 p.m. and her husband was long overdue from his run. Her husband would always return home after an hour or two in the woods, but it was now four hours since he left and there was still no sign of him. Knowing the trail her husband normally took, she grabbed her coat and bravely set out, hoping that David was only injured or lost and unable to come back to the trail. She knew that being out in the wild by herself was unsafe, but for the love of her husband, she was willing to face her fears. With her torch as the only source of light in the darkness, she hiked on the rugged moss trail as her heart pounded away in her chest. The path was rocky and steep, and she found herself stumbling more than once, but she was not one to give up easily. She pressed on, her torch beam cast eerie shadows on the bushes, rocks, and trees around her. With the sounds of the night echoing in the air, constantly scaring her, she had never felt so alone and so far from the safety of her home. She searched and searched, but David was nowhere to be seen. As the night wore on, her feet were growing weary. Exhaustion kicked in and she was slowly giving up. She decided it was time to notify the authorities. Just before midnight, she called Cochrane Royal Canadian Mounted Police and notified them of her missing husband. The authorities then launched a search and a team consisting of a helicopter with a spotlight and police dogs were dispatched. For the next two hours, the search party combed the rugged terrain as they retraced David's steps. 
Just after 2 a.m. Wednesday, the search crew found David's lifeless body crumpled off Moss Trail near Ghost River. The rescue team immediately transported his body to the coroner for medical examination. The officers closed the trail system as investigations into the incident were launched. An autopsy on Dr. David's body revealed the most puzzling and intriguing grizzly encounters ever recorded. The grizzly had attacked from behind and pushed David off the 900-foot cliff. David had then tumbled down to the bottom of the cliff near Ghost River. His wounds were consistent with an instantaneous death being his fate. Track evidence on the hiking trail showed that a single female grizzly that was accompanied by her cub was involved in the attack. The authorities discerned that it was not a predatory attack and that the cub was not involved. Sarah was deeply devastated by her husband's demise, given that she had stood at the exact spot of the attack while searching for him and didn't detect any signs of the attack. She had stood on the cliff above her husband without knowing. After all, she was looking for a man in distress and not for a scene of something bad that had happened. However, the authorities cautioned her against going back to the hiking trails as she also could have suffered the same fate if the bear had seen her. As reality set in, a deep cloud of sadness engulfed her as she replayed their moments together in her mind. Her cries turned to whimpers and for the longest time she was inconsolable. The grief was like a shard in her gut that wouldn't just go away. However, she hoped that with time the edges would dull. Bears come out of their dens in spring, making it a dangerous period to be in the wild. This is because they are usually hungry and wandering to where they had their last meal before the winter came. This was suspected by the Canmore Fish and Wildlife officers to be the fueling factors of the bear's behavior. Following the attack, the officers set baited traps in a bid to capture the bear and understand why this dreadful attack had happened. Unfortunately, three weeks after the grim attack, there was still no bear activity detected in the area. The officers concluded that the sow and her cub were no longer in the area of the attack and removed the traps to mitigate the risk of inadvertently attracting other predators to the trails. They then scaled back their investigation and reopened the trail system to the public after marking it safe to use. The local community at large was saddened by the horrific turn of events and held a memorial in remembrance of Dr. David Lertzman. The University of Calgary's dean, Dr. Jim DeWald, eulogized David as a friend to all and a spiritual leader committed to their indigenous connections. He also added that Dr. David had a profound impact on thousands of students and colleagues. Over the years, he had noted that many of the students Dr. David had taught would come back to him and tell him how his course had changed their lives for the better. The University of Calgary's flag was lowered on May 6th in honor of his service to the community. The authorities reminded people in the backcountry of the need to use marked paths and trails, watch for fresh signs of bear activity, make noise, and always carry bear spray, and know how to use it while out in the woods. Failure to do so may result in your untimely final affliction. Amblipani Kohotra is a village located in the Dahod district in the southeast of India. It's one of those places that seems to have found a balance between the modern world and the old ways. Tribesmen in their traditional clothes walk the streets among the market stalls and cattle roaming free. Farmers still work and harvest from the land like their ancestors have done for thousands of years, and women stroll with baskets of produce balanced on their heads. The countryside is lush and wild, littered with jungle terrain, farmlands, and sanctuaries to keep the indigenous animals safe from poachers, as well as a convenient way for tourists to come and see them. Amblipani is nestled close to one of these sanctuaries, the Sloth Bear Reserve, set out to preserve the endangered Indian bear. The locals have all seen one of these magnificent animals at one point or another, and for the most part, the people stay as far away as possible from these animals. They are by nature aggressive animals, unlike their black and grizzly cousins who will avoid people unless protecting their young or scared. 
They prefer to be left to their own devices, something that the people of Dahod are more than happy to give them. December in India is a quiet time in nature. This is usually when mothering animals retreat into the overgrowth to spend the last few months with their young before setting them off by themselves when spring arrives. Also, there is more food the farther away from people they move. And given that this is the dry time of the year, the animals only come out when food is at its scarcest. And that seems to be the case for a mother sloth bear and her cub. She'd had her pair of cubs two months ago, but the smaller of the two had already died. It was much weaker than its sibling, and the scarce winter foliage and the struggle of fighting its larger and stronger brother for milk had just been too much for the young cub. The female was incredibly protective of her only remaining offspring. She didn't much like going so close to the human settlements, but that's where the food led her to go. And she needed to feed herself and her cub if they were going to see the new growth in spring. On that day in 2021, the bear and her cub on her back were rooting for termites and bugs among the hollows of tree roots. That morning, Sanjali Rathwa was also looking for food, but not for herself. The 42-year-old needed to get her cattle out to graze as early as she could. Even in winter, India is still warm, albeit dry. Sanjali led the herd into the canopy of the trees before the sun could get high, and they could at least find some shade while her animals ate to their heart's content. Sanjali genuinely enjoyed the quiet and stillness of the wilderness, with only the sounds of birds and the crunch of hooves to break the silence. The first three hours went as expected, and Sanjali even found a spot to rest underneath a tree for a good hour before the herd started moving deeper into the bush. She sighed, but decided that there were plenty of other places to keep herself company with her own thoughts, wherever else the cows decided to graze, and set off after them. The sloth bear, with her cub still riding on her back, became acutely aware of the approaching herd of bovines. She yipped at her baby to keep him quiet and made her way up the nearest tree to safety. It was best to wait until the creatures passed before she got back on the ground. But to her already vexed agitation, the cows settled right around the tree she was hiding in. It was not a very high vantage point, barely two meters tall, and she didn't feel especially well hidden. Intermingled with the smell of herbivores, there was another scent, a human scent, that she didn't like at all. Humans were loud and dangerous. She avoided them at all costs, especially now that she had a young one to take care of. And to the bear's great unease, the human walking behind the herd started walking over to the very tree she was hidden in. Minutes dragged by, the woman below in the shade, completely unaware of the animals above her. The mother sloth bear and her cub were so camouflaged that they practically disappeared into the foliage above. The cub's long wait on its mother's back, with only her breathing to lull it into a stupor, slowly drifted off to sleep. Its claws relaxed, and before the mother could stop him, he went tumbling through the branches. The black cub, which resembled a small dog more than a bear, landed with a thump on Sanjali's crossed legs. She let out a startled yell when the flailing baby bear landed on her. Her shouts set several things in motion all at once. A flock of birds shot into the air. Her herd of cows took off running in fright and the mother bear above Sinjali's head let out a roar of panic and anger. She leapt off the branches just as the woman looked up at the sound from above and landed with her full 200-pound weight on top of Sinjali's head, claws already outstretched. Her nails dug into Sinjali's neck and cheeks, tearing and ripping at every inch of her that they could reach in a frenzied attack. The woman was crushed beneath the immense weight of the fully grown bear and she could only try to grab hold of the thick and coarse fur in an attempt to get it off of her. But it was of no use. Sinjali, weighing only 120 pounds at most, was no match for the mother in full protection mode. The claws on her neck yanked away, tearing out a large chunk of muscle and skin. The arterial spray that evacuated the wound coated Sanjali, the bear, and the tree in bright red blood. 
The animal rolled off, got its feet under it again, and went after the screaming woman once more. Sinjali's hands went to her throat the moment the weight was off her, trying desperately to stem the torrent of blood. On her knees, she attempted to get up to run, but she'd lost so much blood so quickly that her knees promptly gave in on her. And then the creature was on top of her again, her jaws closing over Sanjali's whole face. Her teeth sank into Sanjali's skull and under her jaw. The animal shook Sanjali like she weighed nothing, and Sanjali was already too weakened from her injuries to pose any resistance. Her limbs flayed with the force, and her body was limp. The bear shook her a second time and realized that the human had stopped moving. She released Sanjali's head, and the woman lay lifelessly on the ground. A sniff was enough to assure the mother bear that the human was no longer a threat. So she left Sanjali there to bleed to death under the tree and to find her cub, which had stayed hidden behind a large boulder nearby. She decided it was safer to live off less food in the deep jungle after all, and the pair trotted into the foliage, never to be seen again. The day wore on, with no one in the village having any idea of the horrendous tragedy that had occurred to their neighbor. It was only when the small herd of cattle driven by schedule and the knowledge of where their shelter was, came walking back into town, that the people realized that something was very, very wrong indeed. Their handler was not with the cows, and they set out to look for her, hoping that she'd taken a fall or maybe fainted in the heat of the day. But by nightfall, after not finding any trace of Sanjali, the authorities were called in to assist in the search. While the village took care of her worried children, the night dragged on. It wasn't until the next morning that Sanjali's remains were finally found. She'd been almost completely scalped from her jaw to the base of her neck, and what was left of her neck was nothing but a raw, shredded open wound. Authorities could at least determine what had attacked her and that her death had been relatively quick. The sloth bear's first clawing had severed the jugular and main arteries. Sanjali had lost consciousness before the rest of her scalping had occurred in the second wave of the attack. There was a funeral paid for by the state and attended by everyone in the village, old and young. The only sloth bear attack of 2021 in India was a fatality, and the victim was a mother, a sister, and a beloved resident of her community who unfortunately met her terrifying final affliction.